paper. When I was 12, I had a girlfriend called Little Lemon Doodle. I met her on a game called Toontown Online. My character was called Fireball and he was a blue rabbit and every body part was set to long. Fast forward 10 years, I went to university and thus came the genesis of my political thoughts. The young people suddenly love to talk about Marxism. Marxism. What does it mean? <laughs> I traveled through my mindscape. I was desperate for answers. I clung on to anything and suddenly it clicked. DJ, start the music. <laughs> So in reality, I always thought there was some sort of agenda from Toontown Online. I thought it was alone in this, but there are a couple of Reddit threads that talk about it too. I think this is a beautiful take, because it suggests that to some degree, Disney was pushing an agenda onto the children that we should overthrow capitalism. And you know what? They may have a point. Bread tube. Take me into your loving arms. I support the animal video game that wants me to murder the bourgeoisie, and I'll be the one to throw the first pie. So, Toontown Online was published by Disney, and as we all know, Disney is, well, a creative industry shaping mega corporation. It has no reason to present Marxist ideas. In fact, I think Disney is one of the most capitalist things we have. Just looking at their legal moves on copyright and we see that Disney has a vice grip on the media industry. In its near a hundred years of running, it has become such a corporate titan that it began to influence copyright laws, like the one in 1976 about when copyrighted characters are released to the public. Up until Disney's recent opposition to the Don't Say Gay bill, the Disney World Resort in Florida had tax exemption status and effectively ran its own government. Disney also has a little town called Celebration near the resort in Florida and is now moving on to develop story living communities. For nearly a hundred years, Disney has shared stories that have touched the hearts and minds of people all around the world, said Josh Demara, chairman, Disney Parks Experiences and Products. As we prepare to enter our second century, we're developing new and exciting ways to bring the magic of Disney to people wherever they are, expanding storytelling to story living. We can't wait to welcome residents to these beautiful and unique Disney communities where they can live their lives to the fullest. Congratulations! For the very special Disney adult out there, filled to the brim with childhood nostalgia and magic, you can move your personal life in its entirety into the hands of a corporation that has sought to profit from you, from your conception, to your dying day. Yay! So what do we do in the face of a big scary media corporation that's exploiting the lives of people? We publish a video essay about it. So Disney's Toontown Online was released in about 2003, about the same time as Pirates of the Caribbean, Finding Nemo, and the goddamn Lizzie McGuire movie people pay attention. The game was marketed to be this escapist utopia where fun prevailed over all on a subscription-based model. Given Disney's intense cultural impact after its renaissance between the 80s and the 90s, I don't think it's particularly controversial to say that, well, Disney wasn't really struggling here in box office success or revenue. I think they were doing pretty well with the turn of the 2000s. Disney has no reason to turn on its heel and say that it's struggling under the burden of capitalism with a thinly veiled children's game. I think it enjoys capitalism just fine. That being said, Disney didn't just release Toontown Online as their only MMO. They also had Club Penguin in 2005, and Pirates of the Caribbean, and the Winx Club MMO. And I'm not really making a video essay about those. Toontown basically representing Disney's first foray into the online gaming space, came with a clear narrative, even if it was just in the environment of fun and teamwork and having a nice time. 
The game was essentially about two communities with conflicting ideas about what life should be. Club Penguin, for example, was just about being a penguin on an icy island with a little fuzzball thing and making pizzas. It didn't have law. Pirates of the Caribbean and Winx Club basically stuck to their fictitious worlds. They didn't do anything controversial with their storytelling. It was literally just aimed at kids wanting to take their enjoyment of the cartoon and or movie a bit further. It wasn't even just Disney. Neopets wasn't particularly adventurous with its world building either. People know Neopets now for its economy and its cult following, rather than, well, the world of Neopia. Toontown's world building relies primarily on passive acquisition. People talk a lot about how Dark Souls does it, but I think Toontown did it first. You aren't necessarily given a plot, but more so a general objective. As the player, if you want to go out and absorb more information about the world, that's up to you, but you can get through Toontown knowing nothing about it. In the first few years after its release, while you downloaded the game, it would play you this video. It shows Scrooge McDuck, a staple ultra-wealthy character from the Disney universe, saying that in the interest of profit, he's going to march ahead and touch things that don't belong to him. The robot goes crazy and starts producing cogs, the enemy of Toontown and a symbol of corporation, and Scrooge kicks back. He says, heavens to Betsy, not my problem, and it turns to the player to help. Later, this was ripped out as Toontown became more sophisticated, but the core idea of the game remains. There are corporate symbols roaming the streets, and in the interest of community and fun, it is up to you, the player, to destroy them. On your side, as a toon, you have health represented through laugh points, jelly beans, which act as your currency, and you heal by dancing, juggling some cubes, playing with your pet, and eating some ice cream. You aren't human, you're an animal. You don't have health, you have laugh points. If you run out of laugh meter or get hit too much, you don't die or get injured, you just get sad and go home until you're happy enough to go out into the world again. You are removed from the real world in Toontown. Your immersion is based on how much fun you're having, and everything in the game is designed around this ethereal, fuzzy, ambiguous concept of fun. The game is telling you very explicitly that this is a place of joy and relaxation, and all you have to do to keep your happiness afloat is pay £9 per month. It's World of Warcraft, but instead of this convoluted story about the return of a burning crusade or whatever, you are just fighting an endless wave of cogs, and you can do that while playing mini golf or throwing a party. Toontown initially presents itself as anti-work. As the fun-loving toon, you immediately materialize out of, I guess, nowhere to choose your gender. Cancelled. You then choose your species, your clothes, finally your name, and then you're indoctrinated into the fight against robots. The dude behind the counter says, Hey babe, what's your name? Love it, don't care. This is your enemy. Go. Fight. Kill. Win. And you're given your first mission to kill the dude outside. Then the Toontown headquarters gives you more and more missions, like deliverables, defeat X amount of cogs, do this thing, until eventually you reach the end game and you're capped out. Because your arsenal of weapons is comical, you aren't necessarily solving the world through violence, but rather gaggetry and giggling. I don't find much satisfaction from the notion that Toontown is anti-work or whatever. There are a few design decisions, themes, and plot structures that move it past anti-work and hit communism. Or oh, so we think. <laughs> In the script, I literally wrote communism brackets outfit change and I can't figure out how to get from off screen to here in a way that's convincing. So ta-da! <laughs> As I was writing this, a random senator from Arizona posted this on Twitter. It's the Disney logo, but the D is now a hammer and sickle and it's a communism thing now. You and me, Andy, will come back to this. I'm gonna tell the people why you're being a bit cringe. So. 
communism for the umpteenth time is from Karl Marx's The Communist Manifesto. Leading ideas of communism are about empowering the worker and seizing the means of production. The driving force behind Toontown is that there are these big corporations and factories that you can dismantle with the power of silliness. The ethos of Toontown is that you are colourfully distinguished from your corporate cog counterpart where the cogs are bulky, grey, unappealing, boring. Toons, the players, can be named individually and can be distinguished by their species, their colour and the clothing they wear. Cold Caller number one is not in any way distinguished from Cold Caller 372. These cogs are not distinguished in any meaningful way against the rest of their kin. Toontown presents a message that capitalism is unfeeling and strips the worker of their individualism. You can work yourself to death taking to the streets to acquire new venues and new land, and you'll still be slaughtered by a neon red horse called Magma Tech Wheel, and you'll be replaced by a factory. There's a division between the ranks of the cogs, and they're all given derogatory names like Loan Shark, Big Cheese, Telemarketer, whatever. There is a clear power hierarchy between the cogs based on their size, their level, their health, the stage of the game you find them at. They come in four classes, Lawbot, Cashbot, Cellbot, and Bossbot. These classes represent different strains of undesirable traits in the working world. In this sense, it can be taken away that Toontown is about worker rage against exploitation and gentrification of the corporate elite in their residential spaces. There is a subtle yet clear resentment and disgust in the world of Toontown against corporations. Communism, in a heavily reductive utopian reading that would have me guillotined by an actual philosopher, is just about individual expression, public ownership, and communal control. From each according to his ability, and to each according to his needs, and all that. Toontown borrows this ideal, but I don't think it's communist. With the skeletal plot that you acquire passively throughout the game, you are the fun-loving Toon who witnesses the world of Toontown be destroyed by corporations and cogs who colonize your town with their businesses. In this sense, it is very easy to lift a reading that it is anti-capitalist. But also, I mean, you're a worker under Goofy's ironclad grip all the same, but you have a cool shirt on. Hooray! The communism reading is supported by numerous things in the Toontown universe. A common advertising slogan is Toons of the World Unite, which is a clear derivative of Workers of the World Unite, which is meant to be a rallying cry of workers in unionization against their corporate oppressors. This would have Karl Marx gagged. This would de-wig him immediately. When you quick chat derivatives of this in game, like Toons of the World Spend Wisely, you give a flat amount of jelly beans to every other player in the area. This also goes for Toons of the World Gag Up, where your weapon stock is refilled. Going further, in Toontown canon, there is a group called the Toontown Resistance Rangers. Their animation is a fist pump into the air, and their symbol is a raised fist. Raised fists, if you did not know, are commonly associated with worker movements, civil rights movements, and anarchy movements, especially against corporations. You can see a fist, even today, in the campaigns of Black Lives Matter. The raised fist has its cultural roots as early as 1913 during the Paterson Silk Strike, where William Hayward, as part of the Industrial Workers of the World, states that a fist is a metaphor greater than the sum of its parts. The Industrial Workers of the World was one of the largest US labor unionization movements, and they also used Workers of the World Unite phrasing. So there's an in-game group called the Toontown Resistance Rangers, who have a raised fist as part of their slogan, who use Workers of the World Unite phrasing, who help you in battle to fight against the corporate elite. Hmm. 
very interesting, Disney. I see what you've done there. Eventually, we can generate a reading that Marx's ideas had a finger in this game, even if they aren't very well presented. I'm sure he'd want to add something like, you have nothing to lose but your jelly beans. For this reading to hold water, a certain degree of death of the author is required here. If we think about Toontown as just a thing with no producer, publisher, developer behind it, then there are community fortifying aspects that are agreeable and commendable. For example, Toons are encouraged to make friends by sharing tasks and activities. It's really hard to get to the end game of Toontown without making contact with any other Toon. There is no verbal or written communication required. Any player can join an activity provided there is space for it, whether that's go-karting or elevators or minigames or battles. I just ruined the day! Oh my god! <laughs> no! Okay, it's fine. Making friends is fine, I'm fine. Some even communicate by jumping or using emotes. There's no pre-planning required. This was a central design challenge for the developers of Toontown Online. How do you take the MMO space and make it accessible to families and children? In a paper published by the developers of the game, specific attention is drawn to team building. To help make Toontown a social place, we included many shared activities such as fishing, mini games, and cog battles that serve to break the ice and stimulate friendships. As a way to encourage this behaviour, we made it very easy for Toons to team up and form groups, avoiding the more rigid grouping mechanisms found in many other games. To play a mini game with a friend or a stranger, one simply hops on the same trolley. Similarly, one joins a battle just by walking up to it. No verbal communication or pre-planning is required. Sounds pretty commie to me. Forming groups, making friends, having fun. Hmm. If we say that the presence of the Toontown Resistance Rangers is to form a sense of community, then maybe an anti-capitalist reading emerges. In some events, they give you free jelly beans or a free t-shirt, but ultimately their narrative purpose is to help you defeat in-universe evil, the corporations. A Toontown, then, without Disney, might make sense. But I don't think I like this, nor am I satisfied with it. It's like asking me to read Harry Potter without the JK Rowling. And, well, who's doing that these days? Okay, so, new reading. Are the cogs colonizing Toontown? Maybe the Toons are colonizers because they're pushing into the robot factories of Toontown? Why do they want the land so bad when cogs and Toons have incompatible currencies and Toons have no need for whatever the cogs are selling? Could it be that the conflict of Toon and Cog is synthesized by the elite of Toontown? Could it be that Toons do tasks to get jelly beans to buy more merch and weaponry? Could they fight against a cause that seemingly has no end so that the elites of Toontown can spur its workers to work and keep its lights on? Oh, Mickey, no, how could you, you bastard! To start aggressively swinging with cynicism, this reading superficially holds, but I think it's a lot more sinister than that. For all of the tunes of the world unites, the raised fists, the jelly bean economy, the free housing, whatever, you are still in a capitalist framework. You were given streets to go down and you cannot possibly deviate. Jelly beans are an abstraction of currency. They're not as damning as dollar bills or coinage because they're bright, colorful, tasty, desirable. However, you still have to buy the weaponry. Cogs are presented as a world threatening, but not so world threatening that the shop is gonna give you the self-defense mechanisms you need for free. Toontown Central thrives on a wartime economy that Scrooge McDuck created but has not attempted to resolve. If the Toons ever stop revolting or the Cogs stop attacking, the economy stagnates and the player is left listless and, well, unemployed. Not once has anyone tried for a peaceful coexistence, but this conflict is mutually beneficial. Toons develop their technological sophistication 
and the cogs have the chance to claim land. You also still have Clarabelle's catalogue to buy furniture from, shops that will sell you novelty t-shirts, and, well, go-kart upgrades that you need to buy. If you don't have adult permission to use the Freeform Speed Chat Plus, you have a limited stock set of phrases to choose from in how you communicate with other players. And if you want to buy any more, you have to use jelly beans to buy things to say. Can I say a slur? The game sells you better fishing rods to get better fish to then sell to the fishermen nearby who will give you jelly beans for your trouble. Instead of doing more orthodox jobs like business management, data entry, construction work, whatever, Toontown merges your leisure activity in form of mini-games with how you earn money. The buildings that the cogs take over on the streets are positioned as Toon shops even if the tunes inside don't sell anything to you. They stand there, unmoving, unresponsive, but they're still tune shops. They're selling something to somebody, and they represent something. They could really have just been plain old NPCs standing around in their homes, but they're not. The majority of them don't help in your Toontown quest, they just stand there and watch, swaying side to side in these nondescript shops. There is a labour law of value here. You put minigame time in, you get better fish to sell to the fishermen, you complete tasks, and ultimately it has a direct capital return in the form of jelly beans. You feed all of this jelly bean money into one of two functioning shops in the hub areas and you have no idea where it goes. That's not for you to worry about. It's presumably for a good community cause, maybe, because that's what the narrative says, but you have no idea where this jelly bean money goes. Despite this sense of community, there are boundaries everywhere, whether that's with the shop front desk, Flippy the Flop idiot mayor in the HQ, and you. All you know is that well, your social capital is developing, your laugh points are increasing, you have access to new weapons, you are in a better position than the toons who have less laugh points and less gags than you. You are immediately put in a world where the game demands that you consent with its system that it's trying to distinguish from reality. If Toontown is trying to be anti-capitalist, its attempt is spineless, pathetic, nonsensical, which makes sense from Disney. Roach explores this further in their essay, Identity and Commodity in Toontown Online. Roach brings this idea of spatial partitioning, an idea from Foucault, to show that each district in game has its own overseer and division. Foucault's discussion of this spatial partitioning was in regard to the plague. So, what connections might there be between the division of the healthy from the sick and the division of the world of a video game? Just as this kind of panopticism spawned in response to the plague served to mark and distribute, Toontown reminds you that you are always limited and always watched, if not by Minnie or Donald, then by the game administrators. To explain, the Disney characters have their respective districts, like Daisy's Gardens or Donald's Dreamland. In retail Toontown, these characters mindlessly roam the area, saying the same three speech quips, mindlessly staring at nothing. They're like a trapped soul or a prison warden, and I find it pretty hard to distinguish them from the unthinking, unfeeling cog enemy. I don't think the narrative, then, is about destroying corporatization or being anti-work. It's about enforcing the boundaries of a community. It segregates from that which is corporatized by putting tunes in settlements that can only use the circular jelly beans economy. In this isolated community, it has the chance to smother you to death with Disney IP and characters. Presence of Disney characters is normalized, encouraging, exciting, thematic. It's capitalism with a fresh and friendly coat of paint, so mayhaps you enjoy the corporate titan's boot upon your forehead. But like it's a cool and palatable capitalism. Disney wants you, the Toon, to think you are living in an isolated community where Mickey Mouse tells you what to do, and not think about the opposite side where, well, the evil robots reign. Did you ever see Pluto lift a damn finger to fight against the cogs? No! 
The only difference between you and the cog enemies is the currency you use and the outfits you wear. When a cog takes over a shop building, its name is changed from like Big Mama's Bahama Pajamas or something to just Cellbot Incorporated and its level. It's slathered with a morality coding that it's bad and evil because it's not fun and it's not yours. In many ways, this game is just about two different forms of capitalism pushing against each other so that eventually the Toons win. Really, we could even view Toontown under neo -ludism. This encompasses a technophobic machine-smashing philosophy where people fear the machines are going to take their jobs away. For 2003, Disney's release, the machines might take the fun away too. There is a power struggle between Animal and Cog, both representing a degree of humanity and civilization and economy in symbolism and aesthetic presentation. We aren't just pitting humans against the deviant machine, we're also throwing animals against it too. Anthropomorphic bipedal symbols are to dominate and restrain big tech. This is a very intense perspective for a children's game. Is that Daisy Duck? Hey! If the game is targeted to children, there is an immediate need to teach the child how the in-game system and narrative works. It has to use the simplest presentation so even the dumbest child can thrive in it. So, in-game, you were given this trinity to work with. You play mini-games to earn jelly beans, to go to the playground to heal up and prepare, to go into the streets to fight, and then when you're done, you go back to the mini-games and the healing until you incrementally progress through the game. This is the system, but it's fine because it's fun-driven, and it's not just a cruel reflection of the real capitalist world. Donald Duck is there! Woo! And so are your friends! Amazing! So, to those Reddit threads, I say, you think this game is an anti-capitalist allegory. You're trying to sell me this sticker on Redbubble with a knowing nod that I know something the regular populace doesn't. Let's think, why would Disney platform and develop a game about communism or anti-work? I'll tell you, Disney has told you your attitude towards work, and it's not quite as communist as you'd hoped. If you think this reading of Toontown Online is intense or too serious, then that's cool. I think it brought a lot of people together. The design, at its most optimistic, united players young and old. The match mini mini game is also a sleigh. Well done. Category is we got the pink. Ow. However, I am certain that there is a degree in which Toontown Online asks you to passively accept what's happening in its world as it indoctrinates you to Toon camaraderie. Where you think you are internalizing an anti-work perspective, you are also internalizing the Disney universe. As much as you think the developers are on your team with their fun world-building talent, the Disney IP ultimately has the final say. The player accepts a dogma that they are on the morally superior side in-game. They are in Toon Society. The player gets to hang out with Mickey Mouse. You're given a flexible, ambiguous, universally accepted concept of fun, and the indoctrination into a lifetime of Disney nostalgia begins. Don't you enjoy fun? You don't hate fun. You enjoy fun. Let's have fun. Come on. Really, look no further than the essay How to Read Donald Duck by Dorfman and Attilart. Published in 1971, this essay is not about Toontown. Instead, it was published during Salvador Allende's brief Chilean democratic socialist reign. This was before the 1973 coup into the military dictatorship of Pinochet. The essay discusses the now archaic Donald Duck comic strips, North American cultural presence in Latin America, and capitalist ideology, obviously a bit removed from what I'm talking about. However, what this essay does highlight is a core tenet of Disney's philosophy, the preservation of innocence. Toontown does not experience life or death. You simply become unhappy and cogs are lifeless machines to be destroyed. There is no responsibility to take care of anything other than yourself. Your doodle pet will just get sad if you don't feed it instead of perishing. There are no direct familial hierarchies in Disney characters. No sons or fathers, but rather uncles or nephews. It's just you. As Schallenberger puts it, 
The point of all this, according to Dorfman and Matalat, is to lend innocence to the adult world. In the dominion of Uncle Scrooge, gold, criticised ever since the beginning of a monetary economy as a contamination of human relations and the corruption of human nature, mingled with the innocence of the child. The riches he and his nephews acquire always lacks a material origin. Gold simply appears, with no source or origin, just as the children are parentless. This simultaneous lack of biological reproduction and direct economic production is not coincidental. Disney's innocence requires eradication of all reference to the real world. Thus, the Disney strategy of enveloping you in its world and making you think less takes place. Toons and cogs are symbolic, and the war between the two is cathartic yet never-ending. There is effort to make you not think about parenthood, responsibility, labour, tax, economy, whatever. Just shenanigans. At the surface, it really is just a colourful animal running up to a machine to throw gags at it until it explodes. Very literally, there's nothing human about it. There's a lot of escapism to benefit from. The unfortunate reality is, unless you're playing a version of the game, like a private server where the Disney stuff disappears, it's not really just animals and robots duking it out. They're more than that. They're symbols, and these symbols are crafted in light of the current Western world. It's a real art imitates life moment for Toontown. Looney Tunes didn't care, they had Miss Bugs Bunny. Bugs the Bunny. She is a cross-dressing sex icon who takes your heart and your produce. No man has ever described her head as toothy because she only has two teeth. By cutting you off from the world and drowning you in Disney merchandise, Disney music, Disney themes, Disney foodstuffs, Disney actors, Disney characters, and Disney cake baking classes, you are thrust into a world where you believe you are on the brighter side of life, where really you have sold your soul to believing you have found community in a charming media behemoth that doesn't care about you. In their near a hundred years of running, they can master the Disney formula. They produce movies like Frozen, despised in nurseries and hospitals everywhere, and Elsa is immediately recognisable. They have you in their snare, and the company haunts you for a lifetime. So go on, move in. Story Living welcomes you, fun lover. Trust in story living to deliver government laws that are in your best interest. If LGBT groups and the girlies perish for it, well, they should have just chosen to have fun. Go on and give your personal life to the corporation. Put your nostalgia in their trust and it'll all work out. Monetize your leisure in mini games and have access to a special currency. And well, you'll have access to all the Disney wonder. Cynically, Toontown Online has all the makings of a cult, and an anti-capitalist reading of it is just shallow, obtuse, and media illiterate. I mean, I could never join a, a cult. It d hey, what? <gasps> Sometimes you have to set your phone when you're not fine. Oh, okay. Let's go. Three. <laughs> Sorry, boys. What is this, Burning Man? 